That's all right. You can always do that. So anyway, we're going to talk about one, the requirements for a micro 40. Could you move forward, please? Sit in one of the first two rows, since there's not 400 of us. Uh, let me just talk a little bit about what you have to do to get a micro 40 grade. If you record, if you are in registered in micro 40, you have to attend four micro 40 instructor help session, four hours, and you have to do 10 hours of micro 40 lab prep with Naira. And finally, the third requirement is you have to do the take-home take final exam and put it in your final exam packet. Okay, uh, if you haven't finished, if you're a checker, you don't have to do this. But you do need your uh, lab record book signed, so don't forget to have me sign it next week if you're a checker. What if you attended the Micro 40 instructor help, you haven't finished the 10 hours, you're not a checker, all right? Then you include in your final exam packet a contract saying you'll finish whatever hours you have left before the second week of the fall term and sign it and then you'll still get the maximum grade in micro 40. So how do you get a grade in micro 40? If, every, if you don't turn in the final exam, you get an I. If you do turn it in and you've done at least four hours of instructor help but you haven't completed this, then uh, if you do a contract, you'll get an A. If you've done eight hours and you don't turn in a contract, you'll get a B. If you've done six hours, uh, six to seven hours, you'll get a C. And if you've done less than five hours, you'll get a D in Micro 40. So uh, Micro 40 is uh, pass-fail. Could you move up to one of these seats close in to this book bag? Get it out. Chairs are for people, not book bags. <laughs> All right. So, um, almost everybody has done at least four hours of micro 40, so that shouldn't be. How do we tell? We uh, this sign in. So, if you came in late before you leave today, don't forget sign last name, first name, your lecture section number, and the time you arrived. And then on this. If you've done a checker, I need to sign with a Sharpie on the inside cover of your lab record book. If you're not a checker, you need to have signed in with Naira and done at least 10 hours with her. If you haven't done 10 hours, you need to put a contract that you will complete uh, your hours before the second week of fall semester. And everybody must put in their final exam packet that's taking Micro 40, the take home final exam. And to find the take home final exam, Probably the best place to get it. There are two places to get it, but one of them doesn't print very well. If you go to the old website and you go down here to final exam and notes for micro 40, click on it. That will tell you what to do. There's the little lecture that you have to see, which by the way will help you on the final exam because that very same lecture similar to it will be in class and uh, before the final and will be on the final. And then here's a little instruction about how to use our autoplay. And then here's the test. Click on the test, print it out, fill it in, and put it in your final exam packet. And that takes care of micro 40 final exam. Uh, the alternative way to find this is to go to our website, go down to M40 final exam explain, 
This tells you about it. This tells you the purpose and the theory. This tells you how to use our autoclave. Same thing as the other one. And then you print out the final exam at the bottom. Uh, you can cut and paste it if you wish. Either way is fine. It's just it prints out a little bit better on the other one than on this one. But again, it doesn't matter which sort of place you go to it. So does anyone have questions about microporting? Yes? Um, I've actually, I gave her twice in the past few days and she has her flight at the end of the day. Yeah, she should be here between 9 and 4 today. Um, if there is a teensy weensy little problem, I don't know if I should say. Myra had a cancer diagnosis and she's been under treatment and uh, sometimes the medication makes her sick and so she doesn't come. So if you keep, um, keep a, co uh, a copy of your emails and if you do it uh, like four times and she still doesn't return, then uh, he just send me a copy of that in your final exam packet and I'll give you credit for it. Uh, but don't tell her I told you this stuff because it's the first one. All right. Anyone else have a question about Micro 40? All right. So uh, make sure you sign in today to get credit for that. And I want it. Make sure you're sitting next to someone because I'm going to hand out some papers from a previous term for you to share. And would you sit next to her? So you two share number one. Notice they're numbered. I want them back. Little thieves. Okay. Okay, so I guess Volume 1 is gram negatives, I think, and uh, no, 
Yeah, volume one is gram negatives and volume two is gram positives. And it is the best reference of all of them. And so anybody can use it. Remember though, it has a lot more information than you need, but it does have almost everything we do in it. So you can use it. Uh, overall, the best reference of all of them is the eighth edition. Uh, that's where I would start if I were you. For both gram positive and gram negative, the eighth edition and systematic are extremely good. The seventh edition is online. So you don't even have to go to a library to get the seventh edition. And to find it online, you go to unknown paper on the old website and click down at the bottom of the page, see an example paper. Then in the upper right hand corner there it says Burby's Determinative Seventh Edition Online. So you can get your reference and the information to make your table out online for seventh edition. What is seventh good for? It's good for gram positives and gram negatives. It's what we would call a C plus. While the uh, eighth edition is a B plus, the seventh edition is a C plus, and the sixth edition is a C minus book. So uh, the sixth edition, which is <coughs> this one here, sixth edition is a little bit difficult to use because the index the first time they put an index in it, but it's a C minus book for both gram negatives and gram positives. So for gram positives, you're going to be rather limited in what kind of references you can use. Um, you cannot use the ninth edition, it is no good. Uh, you can use the seventh, six, seven, eight, edition of Berge's Determinative, or first edition of Berge's Systematic. Uh, what else do I want to tell you about the references? Again, these are general guidelines. You have to look up your specific unknown in each one, make a little chart of your genus and species information, and see which one matches your unknown the best. The results that you got the best then that's going to be your primary reference. Just a minute. And so that means you have to get them all and do a little research. Now, if the genus says generally non-modal, but your species says modal, go with the species information. The genus information is important and is supposed to apply to everything in that genus, but there are some minor exceptions. So if your species contradicts a little information in your genus, of course you go with the species. Now what was your question? We need three um, sources, three. right? So well, you need three on your data page. Yes. And one of them has to closely match your unknown. So if we have a gram negative and we decide to choose the... Uh, we well, don't decide. You make a chart of all of them and you use the chart that is most match your results. Then you can pick any other two that have at least four or five results in it. In your opinion, what's the best book for ground negative? I think in all of them, Systematic or McFadden, uh, third edition is best for anything, followed by the eighth edition. But gram negative and ninth usually is extremely good because it even will include the spirit blue auger lipase test and the amylase, which you don't find often in any of the other books. <sighs> okay, listen carefully again. You're going to have to look up your genus and species in every book. You're going to have to make yourself a little table, which you are supposed to learn how to do in the library assignment. Then you're going to pick the one that most matches your results as your first column of reference. The other two column of reference must have at least four or five and must closely, does not most closely, match your information. Generally speaking, systematic and ninth edition are the best for gram negatives. So I would make my charts first from there, followed by the eighth. Okay, so um, let's talk about the paper. Uh, everybody has one to look at. 
And I'll show you what I look at to grade. Of course, the title page is very easy. You, all you have to do is put your number and the name of your microbe, and your microbe must be underlined. And the title, remember, even in the title, the species is not capitalized. Then your last name, your college, your ID number, the semester, your uh, the date submitted, phone number, and email. All that goes on the title page. If you'll turn to the second page, and you'll notice that most of these have two title pages. One has comments for grading, and then the second one is the corrected copy. There are two ways the abstract can be typed. It can be typed on a page by itself, justified on all margins, directly in the center of the page with the word abstract above it. Or it can be typed, let's hope I have one, that above the introduction. Does anybody have one typed above the introduction? Ah, here's one. Or it can be typed like this, again, blocked in, at least uh, five to ten on each side from the regular margin. And remember in the APA manual, they'll actually, uh, all the nursing schools require that everything be typed according to the APA manual, which you can go to a copy of right here. And it has very restrictive rules such as every page must have a running head, and they actually have a width number of inches, and it must be two on either side of the abstract and two above. This one would get an F. It's one and a half above. So uh, I'm not that restrictive. I don't take a ruler out and measure your margins, but remember when you get into nursing school, they will. Everything must be exact to APA manual, and if it's not, you get a zero. But it's only for the abstract or the whole? The whole paper. So that is wrong right there. It's yeah, not theirs is, should have a two-inch margin at and the top. And also the stuff underneath it is not two inches from the sides. Yes, but here it is, and there it is. It's not there and there. But that's just for nursing school. For me, I don't care. All I care is that it be blocked in above and the introduction be typed double-spaced, there be no title here, no title abstract, and no title of the paper. Now the abstract is very easy to write. It just says the day you received your unknown and that you did the isolation experiment where you, most people did the four parallel lines with a quadrant streak. You did it aseptically and sterilely. Then you incubated it overnight, and you did the dots or us, where you did a gram stain to see what your unknown shape and gram stain was. You then transferred it to a slant, incubated overnight, and we put it in the refrigerator, and you came back and did the purity check on it. So you would say something like, I received unknown number six on April the 5th, 2013. At that time, I... Uh, aseptically poured a sterile nutrient auger plate with melted auger and allowed it to cool. I then received my unknown in a slant where it contained staph aureus and some unknown microbe for which I was to spend time to identify. I streaked for isolation on my nutrient auger plate using the four stripe quadrant streak method. I take the plate and shut left it in the incubator upside down at 37 degrees overnight, after which it was referred to refrigeration until I returned to class. When I returned to class, I did two different gram stains on different areas of the slant to prove that I had the same organism, the same shape, and the same gram stain, which I confirmed with my instructor. After that time, I maintained uh, my working slant in uh, log phase for testing by keeping it in refrigeration for 10 to 14 days and subculturing into another slant that it was incubated overnight for 12 hours and returned to refrigeration. I performed the following test. And then you list every test you did in the class, you list 
every test you did. Let's see if I can make this one bigger. Control, go, it won't do it. Um, and after each test, and remember the test must be alphabetized. After each test, you put the result in a comma. And so you're going to have a terribly long run on sentence in the middle of your abstract. At the end of that sentence, you'll say something like, using these results and the dichotomous key for a genera on, provided on the microblog website, parentheses Hicks, comma, 2013, and Berge's manual, and then you list which one you used that was most close to your unknown. I identified my unknown number seven as, and you write, the last two words of the abstract should be your unknown. And it should be underlined, and the species should be small letter and the genus capitalized. So that's how to write an abstract. It's not terribly hard. You're just going to put into words those first three or four experiments. What are they? You received it. You isolated it. You um, did the dots or us. And then you did the pur purity and maintained log growth. Then you performed all these tests. Then you used the dichotomous key. Then you used a, an addition of Berge's to determine your species most closely, and that was your unknown. So the abstract can stand alone, separate from the paper, so anyone can know what you did and uh, what you got. Now how to do it, they have to order the paper. So abstracts tell you what you did, what your results were, and then if someone likes the abstract, they can order the paper to learn how you did it. All right, the next section is the introduction, and remember the introduction uh, doesn't have the title, introduction. And it's typed double-spaced, and you can start it on a page by itself. If you put the abstract on a page by itself with a title, or you can type it as this paper did directly below the abstract. So this paper put the abstract, and then began the introduction. Now what goes in the introduction? Why we do unknowns and how we do them. So why we do unknowns is to prove Koch's postulates that you can prove that a particular microbe causes a particular disease and the first step in that is identification. And that's what you're doing. The first step in Koch's postulates which is identifying the microbe. Then of course once you know its name you can treat it. So in this introduction should go a discussion of the following things. Maintaining aseptic technique, that means maintaining your sterility, like wearing your partial universal precautions, heating your loop, uh, the entire wire, flaming the lip, keeping the plates closed as much as possible, those kinds of things to maintain just the bacteria that you have. Maintaining log growth by only a 12-hour incubation and then refrigeration until it's about 10 days old and then redoing that whole thing. And then uh, what else should be in here? Uh, oh, uh, let's see. I guess that's just about it, except you know, don't forget that you're using incomplete universal precautions. Uh, you can talk about microbes in general. The key thing you do not do in the introduction is you don't discuss your unknown. You don't even mention the name of your unknown. This is generally why and how we do unknowns and the purpose of this paper. And it doesn't run on forever. So you can be relieved to know I don't want a five page introduction. I want more than a half a page. But I don't want a five page. I say a page, page and a half would be about right. All right, you can also uh, discuss the fact that uh, in this class we don't use pathogens, but we do use microbes that are in the same genus as pathogens, so you understand the methodology. Anyone have questions about the introduction? And uh, you can look at the introduction online and, you know, get an idea. You can't cut and paste it, of course. All right, so the next section is called the methods. And remember, 
methods can be typed two different ways. Don't type it the prose way, which is writing a story referenced of everything you ever did. Please don't do that. Just put it in a table like this. You have three columns. The first column is every test you did in your class this term that got a result. Now, if you came in, you were sick when I put out gelatin or litmus milk, and when you came in, there was none, then it should not be in this list. Everything that's in this list, you should have a result for on the data page. So remember, the first column of the methods table is the same first column as the data table. All your tests that you perform in alphabetical order. All right, so uh, does everybody know how to do, make a table? Yes. Okay, if you go to Word and all you have to do, uh, let me see if I have one on here. must be removable from your paper because lots of times when they give a presentation on the paper they hand everybody out a copy of the tables so the tables must be removable what do I mean by that you don't run into a table at the top and you don't start typing the next section at the bottom of a table it must be on pages by themselves so if you can fit a table on one page, that's great. But if it runs to two, don't start the next section in the middle of the next page. So you do a page break at the beginning, before a table, and a page break at the end of a table so that it sits by itself in your paper. All right, uh, on the second column of the methods page, the second column of the methods is how you learn how you did each experiment. And the only place you can find out how you did it is from the blog site or the micro website. So you have to give a unique identifier in the second column for a web um, reference. And the unique identifier is everything after the web address. So if I was going to give the on the methods page here, here's the title. Remember, it does have a title at the top of it. And then it has your tests. And then it has the reference. And then it has anything that you did that was not the same as in your re reference. And this is called exceptions. So if you did the BP on, and it said do it on day 10 to 14 and you did it on day 15, you have to put that in exception. All right, so what you do here is you put an asterisk there and then at the bottom of your reference of your methods page of your table, you put the whole address of the main website. If you're using the old website, it would be http forward slash forward slash faculty dot LA City College dot edu forward slash Hicks dr now when you went to one of the pages of the website 
can use one of these. When you went to the page of the website that was about, let's say, the uh, let's say EMB auger plate, here's what you would do. You would go to the website, click on the unknown paper, I mean not unknown paper, shoot, unknown test. You would then go to the EMB plate, which I believe is somewhere down here. Yes, in methylene blue. Click on that. And at the top of this page, it gives you the, actually, you know, that's just how to pour a plate. There. At the top of the page, it tells you what the unique identifier for this page is. And for this one, it's, remember, it's always everything after HDR. So for this page, what you would put is emb.htm. So on the reference, if I was referencing eosin methylene blue plate, then I would put asterisk dot emb.htm. Does everybody understand how to do it? It's not hard. Every page where the directions on how to do a test are, there is a unique identifier at the top of that page. That unique identifier goes in the reference column. Yes? You need a dot the Yes, you need the dot. Uh, how come these um, papers that we got don't have it that way? They what do they do? They have the whole thing in there. Uh, because they did it wrong and I took off points. Uh, the paper that you're looking at, for an example, did have it, but because so many people cheated by just copying my example paper, I took them out. So if you go to this unknown paper that we're using as an example, hopefully it will load in here. Come on, baby. one of these for catalase pay test if the unique identifier is catalase test.htm. Actually you're right. It doesn't have this. It has this. Alright, so everybody know how to do that? Alright, so I don't think this one gives a Students actually go to the top of each page 
and Shen. So. I think you're not supposed to put that line because see, nobody did it in their paper. Well, they, I'm the teacher, they're not. So do it that way? Yeah. Remember, it depends on how you do it at the bottom down here. If you leave it off like this, then the line goes there. If you put this like that, then you can leave it off. Yeah, it's supposed to, remember, computers don't allow mistakes. So you must be able to copy all of this and add what's here and go to that page. So that's what it means. All right, so we've talked about how to make the methods page. Let's go to the data page. And I can see what she did now. She centered every one of these tests. It's better to move them with the left margin and put them in. And then she had, she put it in a table and then had the table white out the lines. Remember, you can make the lines any color you want. So she made them white against the white paper. Regardless, um, what, oh, smart student, I like that. <laughs> So remember, whatever test you did should be here, alphabetized, and then your results in the first column. And the Burgess manual that most matches yours in the column after that. And then two other references that have at least four results. Now, uh, remember, the most common error on this data page is everybody does it, and I don't want you to. So let's talk about the most common error on the data page, and that is, yes, they put their tests, yes, they put their results, and then they must start making the mistakes. So this would be the sixth, maybe, and this would be the seventh, and this would be the eighth edition of Burgess. And let's say that we have phenol, red, lactose. And then EMB, and then hectoin. And clickers, iron. Litmus mill. And then ONPG. Somewhere in their test. And over here, they said they got, they got a test positive for that. And they probably got a positive. Maybe they one of these didn't work exactly like it should. Remember, everything working perfectly makes me very nervous. Uh, and on the sixth edition, it said all of these, it said lactose was positive. So that means that every lactose test, remember EMB has a lactose test on it, and hectoin has lactose and H2S on it, so the lactose. All these references for every lactose test should be positive because that's glucose, lactose, and hydrogen sulfide. So this one, even if you've got a negative, since this lactose is positive, every lactose test is going to be positive in your references. So, in the tests that have multiple tests within them, what are they? Hectoin. What does it have? It has a lactose, it has an H2S, and it has a color of the, auger, of the bacteria growing on the auger. KIA has glucose with or without gas, lactose, and hydrogen sulfide. Litmus milk. as lactose and caseas. Uh, let's see, is there any other one? EMB is just lactose. So remember that you can't put hectoin positive or negative. You have to put the results for each test that's on that. So there'll be no result for these. The test underneath will have the results. Uh, finally, on the plates. 
Remember to call the plates by their name, but in parentheses put the enzyme they test for. So you would have skim, milk, auger, and then in parentheses that would be casease. And let's see, hectoin. No, not that one. Uh, spirit blue. Auger. And in the end, in parentheses, it should say lipase. Because in your reference books, it's only going to call it lipase. In the ninth edition, they'll have a result for casease and lipase, but they won't have one for skim milk auger. And of course, then the starch auger plate. It's analase in parentheses. So, particularly in the ninth edition, they do give these plate results as enzyme results, not as the name of the auger. All right. So, on the data page, what if you get something? that no one else has ever gotten on earth, ever. Your result was urea, your urea was negative, and the sixth said it should be positive, and the seventh said it was positive, and the eighth said it was supposed to be positive. Then you put an asterisk in front of it, and down at the bottom of the page you say this unusual result will be discussed in the third paragraph of the conclusion. Now, what if one of your books said it's positive, the other one said it could be negative, and the other one said positive and you got negative? You don't have to explain anything and there's no asterisk. Only if you got a result no one on earth has ever gotten before. What about if you got something and you can't explain why it's wrong? You can. There are very common excuses, which is why we call it the excuse paragraph. All right, so any questions about how to do the data? Oh, one super thing that everybody forgets. You don't want three points taken off. We're not putting a key to symbols used. I wonder if they did. I don't think they did on this one. So remember, if you use this, you got to tell me what that means. If you use this, you got to tell me what that means. If you use X, you got to tell me what that means. Big D, little d. Those are symbols that all these books use and Positive does not mean 100% positive. In most books, it means 82 to 97% positive. Now, where do you find that information? Almost always, the symbols that are used in a book are either just inside the cover, printed on the cover, like on the ninth edition, like in here, or in the first few pages, they will say a key to symbols used in this book. So. That's usually where it is. And you're going to have to look for it. Sometimes it's right on the table. In a big reference book like this, I know in the ninth edition, it's in the first few pages, they tell you what key to symbols used. So for each edition that we use, we have to put it right? Because the six editions... Uh, if they use different edition, symbols and it means different things, then you have to yes. include that. Now you can, I mean, smart people do, is they take the symbols in the different books and they organize it and make their own. So they say, in my paper, positive like this, positive, positive means 99 to 100% positive. And positive alone means 87 to 99% positive. So you can make up your own and keep them consistent, or you can just copy the symbols from the addition and then put us what it means at the bottom. Well, what I'm saying is there needs to be three of those, right? Because we're going to use three no. references. Yeah, we're going to no. use three different. You're not listening to me. Burgess usually keeps it consistent. So 
one edition, sixth, seventh, and eighth will probably use the very same symbols. So you wouldn't need three if they all use the same set of symbols. If each book uses a different one, like this one that I handed out, this little sheet of paper that I handed out, doesn't use positive and negative. It, it, what it uses is even more confusing. It uses NC for no change, which is negative. It uses Y for ferments, which is positive. It uses YG for ferments with gas. It uses positive for 100% positive. And it uses this for either could be correct. All in one little table. So, like I said, the table will tell you. And you can, most people just do it the easy way. What's the easy way? You copy the symbols from the table, from the edition, and then include it in a key. All right, so the next section is the only section that is any difficulty. I mean, all of this, you just copy down your results and going to a reference book and filling it in the table. Yeah? I have a question. When, you did, like, when we make our own symbols, how do we know if it's 99 to 100 positive? Section in front of the book. But the symbol oh, we're just changing. Okay. Yeah. All right, so the last section is the conclusion section. And it's extremely specific what goes in each paragraph. And what goes in each paragraph is the first paragraph, of, first of all, you type it with it, the word conclusion at the top, and it's double spaced, and the references are the same way, author's last name, date published, etc. But the first paragraph is your dichotomous key from the website. In words. So you take, it's, in other words, the first paragraph of the conclusion is how you got your genus. So you say, using the dichotomous key provided by the microblog site, parentheses Hicks, comma, 2013, parentheses closed, I determined that a gram negative rod which fermented glucose was citrate positive, hydrogen sulfide negative, and Bogues Proskauer negative was Proteus, the genus Proteus. So you can make, and yeah, I know, sometimes it'll be a one sentence paragraph, which again will drive a English teacher nuts to bed. They're not here. All right, so that's the first paragraph. It is a word story of your dichotomous key. Second paragraph is the most important, and that is, how did you get your genus? And the answer to this question is always one or two tests. In other words, in looking at the several genera, I mean, several species in my genera, uh, I determined uh, that uh, my unknown had a motility and a hydrogen sulfide that uh, matched the species uh, flexner flexneri. And the other species had a different combination of hydrogen sulfide and motility result. So it is always one or two tests that separates the different species. Oh, yeah, I meant species, thank you. And be sure, of course, to reference it. Now the third paragraph of the conclusion is what we call the excuse paragraph. We used to call it the funky results, but people typed into their paper, funky results. And you know that should never be in a paper. So here are the excuses. If you got a negative, and it should be positive, 
then these are the most common errors. Your unknown was dead from drying out in the refrigerator by the time you did that test. Two, uh, your loop or needle was too hot when you inoculated. The media itself was out of date or prepared wrong. So we choose one of these? No, you make a list. Uh, because you don't know which one of these it was. Fourth, if it used reagents, the reagents were bad. Only if you used them, remember, if you didn't use them in that test, you can't say reagents because reagents work. Fifth reason, you did it wrong. Like the people that inoculated their methyl red and then added the methyl red reagent and put it in the incubator. They did it wrong, so they're not going to get the right result. And then the last and least likely, and you need to say it's least likely, your unknown mutated. Remember, mutation takes thousands of years, so it's unlikely that that, that, that is a reason for you getting uh, a negative result. What if you got a positive and it should be negative? That one doesn't have any excuses. There's just one super big one. Most likely it was contaminated. Probably from the air, something else, but it was contaminated. Remember, you can't make something out of nothing. So, it had to have some other microbe in there to cause a positive result. So 99% of the time, if you got a positive and it should have been negative, is it was your culture was contaminated by something from the air or you were uh, didn't get it properly isolated in your dots or us experiment or maybe you inadvertently stuck your working culture in the incubator and it uh, grew up some of the things that fell in it. And then the second and the least likely and highly unlikely is it mutated. So if you've got a positive when it should be negative, there are just there are a few things that can happen to make that happen. Alright, so that's the third paragraph, and you're explaining away any of your double asterisks. I mean your asterisk from the data page. Alright? Now, the fourth and other paragraph, fourth, fifth, anything, subsequent paragraphs after the fourth, you've got to put who discovered your unknown, or who named it, or where it's normally found in nature. And then finally, the most important thing to put in here, oh, I love this, the species for the genus Gobbledygook Negotia. <laughs> This is what my assistant did. I told him, don't tell him too much of the information. Just put some fake stuff in there. So she put that this species was Negotia of the genus Gobbledygook. Oh. <laughs> Sense of humor. All right, so anyway, uh, who named it? When it was first discovered? Where it normally lives in nature? And most importantly, you need to relate it to a pathogen. My unknown was Shigella paradisentery. The reason the teacher gave it to me was because this is highly related to the pathogen Shigella dysentery, which causes hundreds and thousands of deaths in the world every day. Uh, we are not allowed to work with extreme pathogens, and therefore we couldn't work with the actual disease, so we worked one with one that looked like it and was in the same genus but a different species. So remember, in the fourth and subsequent paragraph, you have to put interesting information about your unknown. And what's interesting? Who named it? 
when it was first discovered, where it grows in nature, and then how it relates to a pathogen that is dangerous to people. Usually it's right in, uh, uh, I mean, you know, in your list of species, there is a dangerous one. It says causes horrible human death or whatever. But yes, you can do that too. You can uh, go to ask.com and put in species of the genus, blah, 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 that cause human, significant human disease. All right, the last part is the reference page. And, oops, these people typed it wrong. Ah, well, one of them typed. One of their references is right. All right, at the top you have the word reference. It's usually not all caps, but anyway. This is the way they should be typed. Remember, you put these in alphabetical order. You don't put them in uh, any numbers out here. And if there's more than three authors, you put the title of the book, not the list of editors or authors. And notice the title of the book is the, the first word is the only one capitalized. Followed by the edition, when published, who published, where published, and then the pages in order that you quoted them. And how it's typed is every line after the first is indented five. So... This is the way it should be typed within a reference. It's single space between its double space. Second and third lines are indented uh, five spaces. And you've got to have six. And if you want to know what the six that most people use, they use a quote, they use uh, coaches' postulates from their textbook. They use some sort of uh, maybe color or information about the chemistry of one test from their atlas so they can quote their atlas. They quote the website and then of course you have to have three books, three reference books, either Burgess, McFadden, Systematic, or, uh, and remember if you have a famous microbe there could be a reference book out there that you could use that's online that is all about E. coli or whatever if it gives at least five results. Uh, how to type a website, remember last name, first name, the date that the website was accessed, I mean the year, then the name of the website, then the date it was accessed, and the time, plus the exact page of the main website address. Okay, so that's generally the paper, uh, now I'll take questions on the paper. Anybody have any questions about anything about what goes where or how to type any particular thing? Oh, let me talk about cheating. What is cheating on this paper? Claiming that you came up with coaches' postulates without referencing it, saying that you devised it from your own brain, which means you didn't reference a major scientific discovery. Okay, so failing to reference something. Uh, Making up your data. You didn't do three quarters of the test, so you just make up something. Or filling in the blanks on the data page under your references with just random positives and negatives to make it look pretty. Remember, sometimes the references only have four out of 25 tests. Leave it blank if they don't reference it. But remember, you must know that EMB is a lactose test, HECOA is a lactose test. Wicker's iron is a lactose test, and phenol red um, lactose is a lactose test. So if it says ferments lactose, all of those references would be positive. Okay, what was your question? Somebody have one? Yeah. After the first paragraph, right? Right. On the uh, yeah, when you were dichotomous key. Yeah. Other things. Minor little problems, whiny little problems. Everybody get their grade sheet? Be sure to check your grade sheet and circle anything that uh, the number doesn't match. Remember I have dyslexia, so every once in a while I will give somebody a seven that got a 70. Not a good idea. So, and if in your micro one, for some reason I didn't scan the micro one practice midterm, so you need to bring me those so I can include it because I gave you a 10. Okay, so if uh, the numbers don't match, bring me circled on the grade sheet, 
bring me the paper to show me what it should be, and I'll change my gradebook. Yes? Just to clarify, on the, um, there was a, uh, an option.